The MacBook Pro Dilemma, a decision of want or need. The Pro moniker over the years has been one of confusion, a marketing term to sell more expensive items, and one of downright misconceptions. Brands have used the Pro status to sell overpriced and underperforming products. You only have to look towards the smartphone industry to realise how silly the naming schemes have become. The MacBook Pro over the years has had a wave of admiration, and then years of ridicule. Controversies, and more recently, back to messiah-like praise. What defines a Pro? The dictionary definition is someone engaged in a specified activity as one's main paid occupation rather than a pastime. So if you're the type of person who uses a computer for a paid job, this MacBook Pro by definition is marketed directly to you. When Apple implemented Apple Silicon, things changed with almost every hardware limitation brought on by the Intel lineup simply vanishing overnight. Claims of an all-day battery life, unheard of power in a portable computer, and all without breaking a sweat. It changed the way the industry looked at portable computers, and then with barely any time passing, Apple released the M1 Max and M1 Pro systems on a chip, which once again changed the landscape of personal computers. That was October 2021, but with over a year passing and Apple releasing the new M2 chips with reported 40% improvement, Will a 16-inch MacBook Pro with an M1 Max still be a viable and worthwhile investment in 2023? The short answer to this is yes, but with a few caveats. It all comes down to your profession, use case, and budget. Apple has proven you can now produce almost anything on a base M1 or M2 chip. The most basic MacBook Air or Mac Mini with Apple Silicon can be purchased for as little as £500 today. The M1 and M2 Max takes everything about the M1 and M2 chips and increases it substantially. My configuration has been far more powerful than I could potentially need for the next two to three years. It all depends on whether my profession requires me to upgrade my gear, which will then push this machine even further. For context, I have a 16 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Max, which has 10 CPU cores, 32 GPU cores, 32 gigabyte of RAM, and a one terabyte hard drive. For my day-to-day -day workflow of photo editing and video editing, this machine handles everything I throw at it. My background work is in videography and photography. My photography work is mainly real estate and therefore I work in a HDR workflow. Five continuous photos blended with a preset I've created with many masks applied, throw in object removals and minor tweaks and you have a fairly intensive workflow. Video work is similar, I shoot with an A7 III in 4K and a Mavic Air 2S drone at 5.4K. Video editing on the M1 Max with Premiere Pro has been flawless for me. I was a late adopter of Apple Silicon, having purchased this in August 2022. There was a lot of chatter about Premiere Pro being unusable when these processors were first released, and many switched to Final Cut Pro and DaVinci Resolve. Fortunately, with my workflow, I have not had to do this and I've had zero complaints about Premiere Pro on Apple Silicon. Time is the greatest healer and these issues seem to have been resolved, making Premiere Pro reliable once again. When blending 524 megapixel photos, it would take approximately 5 seconds on the M1 Max. With my previous Intel MacBook Pro, it would take almost 25 to 30 seconds. This is a huge performance increase and time saver when you factor in that I will be blending anywhere from 200 to 1000 photos based on how big the job is. With video editing, it is a case of editing in a 4K 24 frames timeline mixed with 5.4K drone footage, adjustment layers, animations, and color grading. The best way I can describe how much of a quality of life improvement this laptop is compared to my old MacBook Pro is that it remains silent the entire time I am editing and rendering projects. The most crucial quality of life improvements are full resolution playback with effects and color without dropping a single frame. 
There is also the speed improvements of Warp Stabilizer and being able to work with other apps simultaneously without any loss of performance. As someone who is by definition classed as a professional whose day-to-day -day job relies on efficiency, quick turnarounds and minimal downtime, this has been an absolute game changer for me. And with the efficiency and speed, I've been able to increase my workflow without adding extra time or stress to projects. Things however, aren't all perfect. And the main complaint I would like to bring forward is the reported battery life. When researching the M1 Max, I read a lot about how incredible the battery performance was. People were stating they could edit a video all day without needing to charge and still have more battery to keep them going. I found this not to be the case with myself. Even with it set to automatic power control when on battery, I would average around 5 hours of battery life when editing photos and videos non-stop. This is a huge improvement on the 1.5 hours I would get on the old generation, but this is a far cry from the stated 19 hours I was seeing from other news sources. With non-video editing and photo editing I could extend this battery and it has absolutely lasted all day for basic web browsing and content consumption. But here lies the issue, this is a pro device and I only use it for paid work and YouTube content creation. I have an iPhone, an iPad Pro and a TV for media consumption. I also have a gaming PC if I ever feel playful. So some more improvements in the battery department would be very welcome, even though this is a step above any other product out there right now. The return of MagSafe and standard ports has truly brought this back to a professional standard. There are some exceptions though. The HDMI port, to me, is a waste of real estate. I would have much preferred another Thunderbolt 4 port in its place. There's no reason why anyone should need this HDMI port as USB-C to HDMI adapters and cables are priced at less than £10. Replacing this with an additional Thunderbolt 4 port would open up options of more expansion and even more daisy chaining with other Thunderbolt 4 devices. The SD card reader is a nice inclusion but over time I found it to be slower at transfers than external card readers. This seems to be the case if I leave the MacBook Pro on for days without restarting it. It is a very odd bug that I've found, as I do not have this issue of slow transfers when using my Thunderbolt dock, so I believe this is limited to the built-in card reader. I couldn't really tell you about the headphone jack and whether it powers high impedance headphones, as I use wireless earbuds and the MacBook Pro's built-in speakers 90% of the time. These speakers are truly fantastic and a step above any laptop speakers I've ever heard. I will also go as far to say as these are better than any desktop speakers I've heard under a £50 price bracket. The screen is fantastic, the colour, the response time and the general size are all perfect for anyone who needs a reliable screen on the go. The notch was a huge issue for many when it was first announced but I've never once noticed it to be anything more than a style choice. It doesn't get in the way or take up any space. The fact that the menu bar blends in with this notch gives the impression that it is almost invisible to me. This whole machine at the time of purchase set me back £3,299 from the Apple Store. That is an incredible amount of money for any computer, let alone a laptop. Has this device justified that price? Well, there are many questions to answer. Has my workflow improved? Have I delivered more projects in a shorter time and has this led to more work? The answer to all three of those questions is yes. From a purely productivity sense, it has warranted its cost. I'm now able to go out on more jobs and turn them around on the same day. This means my employer gets a greater service, more work and the company can then provide the customers with a better experience. Would I then recommend you go out and spend £3,299 on a laptop? No, I wouldn't. The reason is, you do not need a laptop this powerful and neither do I. I simply wanted something that would last me the next 2 or 3 years, just like my i9 MacBook Pro did. However, with the introduction of the new M2 Pro Mac Mini, anyone would be an absolute fool to not pick up this level of power in such a small form factor. With this additional money saved you will gain a machine that is far too powerful for most, a small compact size, more ports and a newer chip. Then, with that £1,300 difference, you can pick up an incredible monitor to match it, a keyboard, mouse and even extra external storage. I very rarely take my MacBook Pro out of my stand 
The only time it leaves this space is when I take the odd trip to the office. If I knew this back when I purchased it, I would have splashed out on a base M1 Max Mac Studio and a display for around the same price. Even then, I could easily carry that to work and connect it to a monitor there. The days that you would need to spend thousands of pounds or dollars on a machine to create content or produce professional grade work efficiently and quickly are over. The most basic Mac Mini with M2 Pro is now the go-to standard, I believe, for 99% of people. It will handle any workload you throw at it, while also being substantially more affordable than one of these MacBook Pros. In my honest opinion, the most expensive MacBook Pros are no longer warranted for almost all but a handful of people. The MacBook Pro is now a want rather than a need. If you do have the money to spend on one comfortably without getting yourself into any debt, there is no shame in wanting to do that. They will truly last you years to come. But for everyone else, or those who do not need the upper echelon of computing, the Mac Mini is the best Mac you can buy right now.